Welcome back, everyone. It is Caitlin Bird, your favorite service dog trainer uh, on the internet. And it's a really just overcast, bleh day here in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania. So we're going to go over some articles here today. Um, I wanted to first showcase. <laughs> I put sparkles on my face today, okay? Mermaid-esque vibes, all right? All right. I, I, I'm, I'm vibing. I'm vibing so far. I'm vibing. So we've got an article here. This is from Telluride Daily Planet. Honestly, no idea where this is at. If anyone knows a 970 telephone number, let me know in the comments below. Um, so we've got our puppy article here. The last time I reviewed one of these, I was not impressed. Um, and, and I was mildly depressed. So let's hope for the best here. Um, puppy articles don't always um, have the best advice because the dog training in industry is unregulated. And there's a lot of old information circling, circulating out there. So let's dive right in. Katara, a puppy at Second Chance Humane Society, is waiting patiently for a heavy, uh, a forever home. This is from by Lee, Lee Walter. If you're a parent or have spent time around babies, you know that they put everything in their mouths. Toys, fingers, clothing, literally anything and everything. Putting toys and other household objects in their mouth allows babies to discover the taste and texture of different objects. But human babies typically don't have a mouth full of sharp, needle-like teeth like canine babies. Um, I want to put my own information here as well. Keep in mind the reason, the driving force behind this behavior, both for babies and kids, is that oftentimes their, so their gums are really, really sore. You probably don't remember when your teeth grew in. That is a good thing because that is a very painful process. They get red, they get irritated, and very, very sensitive. And they're looking and they're searching for something to put in their mouth to help them feel better, okay? Article continues to go on saying, puppies bite people and objects for a variety of reasons, including exploring the world through their mouths. Biting and chewing are normal parts of puppy development. Very true. Reasons that your puppy might be biting you or things around your house include learning, teething, I might, I might have put that one first, Stress, that, that goes hand in hand with teething, boredom, and play. Understanding the reasons doesn't mean it's something to ignore. Puppies should learn to keep their mouths to themselves at a young age to prevent behavioral problems in the future. Training a puppy not to bite takes a patient and gentle approach. So yes and no. There's actually been research done on this, and I would have to go and dig up the articles but I'm trying to remember who I got this information from. Was it Susan Garrett or was it somebody else? I might have read it in one of my books back there that puppies do grow out of teething for the reason I mentioned earlier, pain and discomfort, right? If your teeth don't hurt anymore, you're not going to be nearly as needy to shove things in your face. For most breeds, Labradors might be an exception. Sometimes that becomes a game of chase me and then you go around running in circles after your dog and it becomes just fun, right? For the dog, not for you. <laughs> but by and large, puppies grow out of this because the driving motivator has stopped. Their teeth have grown in, right? Um, so take that into consideration. Um, it's not 100% a training issue. Although training does help, it is not the driving motivator for the dog's behavior. What else do they have to say? First, ensure the puppy has appropriate chewing options, including puppy safe chews and toys. You don't want to stop your puppy from chewing, you just want them to chew on safe and appropriate things. I agree. If your puppy is biting you when you play, don't yell or punish. One suggestion is to make a high-pitched crying sound and then redirect your puppy to a safe and appropriate toy for them to bite or chew on. 
by making a high-pitched crying sound. You're telling your puppy that the biting hurts. Doing this mimics the feedback puppies get from their litter mates about how to bite softer or less while playing. So I want to come at this bit of information from a couple different angles, okay? The first one being it doesn't work for all puppies, right? Some puppies, typically as they get older, might find it enjoyable that you are yelling in when you get nipped. And sometimes that can amp them up and encourage them to start going after you more. Okay, take that into account. The other angle I wanna come at this at is just because it works doesn't mean you have to do it, right? Some dogs are also extremely sensitive to your emotions as a person. And that's not something that animals in the wild naturally do, right? We bred for this characteristics in our dogs over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Certain breeds have more empathy or focus on human emotions than other breeds. Some breeds don't care, right? Like an, an Akita would be a good example. They're pretty independent. People describe them more like cats. Cats typically don't come over to comfort you. If you do get a cat with that, you are extremely lucky. Okay, so a lot of these things do depend on the breed as well. The other thing is that if your puppy is excessively getting into things they shouldn't be getting into, like stealing your socks or your shoes all the time, or maybe they're getting into garbage, or maybe they're chewing on pieces of your furniture, maybe it's metal that's attracting them, right? Typically when it's metal, why do they go for metal? Because it's really cool. And it feels good on their teeth, right? So right there, it's telling me, if I have a client that comes to me with these problems, I say, well, why are you setting them up for failure? Why are you letting them free roam all across the house? And that's usually the first thing we discuss. Um, and there's a variety of options that you can do so that you don't have to yell, ouch, and make your puppy feel bad, especially if they're the kind of dog that is really empathetic towards your feelings or the kind of dog that just gets amped up when you do it. So those are, that's my two cents. Be consistent while playing with and training your puppy. Puppy bite training should be something everyone in the family is on board with by consistently and gently redirecting your puppy to save chew toys. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's constant redirection is what it is. It's like this, not that, this, not that. Oh, you found something that looks like a shoestring and you want to chew on that? Let me get a, a, a thinner rope toy so that you can chew on this instead. You don't want them swallowing it, but chewing, tugging, that's fine. That's fine. Um, there was something else I wanted to say there. It'll, it'll come back to me. Supervision is very important for puppies. Puppy proof your home by making sure they can't chew on things that could be harmful or might be valuable to you, such as electrical cords, harmful or poisonous plants and foods, small items that are choking hazards, and of course, your favorite shoes. What did I say? Puppy proofing also means removing temptations like a garbage can, cat litter box, yep, diaper bag. Ooh, yeah, that's a big one. Or people food. Now that stuff should be in a puppy's mouth. People food, I like to use for training. Uh, that's usually in structured interactions though. Definitely not laying out and about because then we are going to teach our dogs to counter surf and jump on tables for food. So correct, <laughs> within, within, within reason, within reason. A puppy can bring so much enjoyment and fun to your home. Don't let their cuteness prevent you from being a responsible pet parent. If appropriate behaviors are not trained well when they are little, they can become dangerous as they grow up. A biting puppy is cute. A biting adult dog is a hazard. Okay, hold on. Again, I reemphasize this point. Puppies grow out of chewy phases. Puppies grow out of chewing phases. Puppies grow out of chewing phases. Okay? Um, if your dog isn't getting their needs met, appropriate chewies, appropriate exercise, appropriate brain games and sniffing and walking opportunities you have a bigger problem on your hands and sometimes that can lead dogs to get restless 
and stressed out and sometimes it can cause um, a dog to become more like hyper aroused like very very easily excitable or very very easily nervous which then can also lead to the excitability um so i would have focused a little more on meeting your dog's needs and how to do that what kind of puzzle toys do i like to use what things do i recommend why sniffing is important why you want your dog to sniff on walks you don't want them to be in a constant like obedient type heel with a very tight leash that doesn't do anybody any good except for your own ego um so it, it is a walk together right when i when i walk my dog it, I, I walk for them i walk for my dog um my clients dogs they're in a perfect heel but i also allow them the ability to sniff as long as they don't shoot ahead of me and start pulling they can sniff by my side as much as they want. I will stop, I will slow down, I will let them sniff. My my dog, he's got a really fast pace. So I have a very I he knows how to heal when I need him to. But when I don't care about training, I also have a, a special harness and a special leash hookup where I just let him pull me around and I walk with him, right? Um again, that depends on the breed and your size and your weight and what you're comfortable with and able to handle, etc. But that's what works for us. And he has a fantastic time. And when he pulls, he actually trims his nails down a lot faster if we go on daily walks and he's pulling on that walk. Your dog isn't going to get that trimmed nail from being in a tight leash heel. Like it's, it's not going to happen. <laughs> like definitely not as quickly. Um, all right. That being said, yeah, biting, that oftentimes is a socialization thing and or combination with genetics genetics plays a huge role in that let's see this was by katara and the last oh my name is katara okay this is about the puppy hold on i'm the last puppy from my litter to find a home i'm a husky roddy aussie mix wow so i'll be a big smart adult dog please let me join your family for years of fun and learning and she's for adoption at second chance humane society animal resource center and thrift shops in san miguel uh, in these counties. Interesting. All right. Fantastic. Uh, what's the next article we have here? All right. I want to read this first. They do have a wonderful video. This is from NCW Life Channel. I have not heard. It's amazing how many, the more I do this, the more channels I'm hearing about. They're usually hyper local places. Wintachi, pancake. Okay, see again, like where is Wintachi? I don't know. Puppy raising club. I don't know. Wintachi. I wish they gave the state. Okay, let's get to this. Pancake, Farley, and Kudzu look professional in their green puppy and training vests. You can see they're patient, if not still a little rambunctious, but these three pups are part of a much bigger vision. They're with the Wentachi Puppy Raising Club, a group of 15 volunteers who work with guide dogs for the blind. The club exclusively raises puppies in the preliminary learning stages of becoming working guide dogs, caring for them until they are ready for formal training. The club that relies fully on donations and volunteers is looking for more people to help them with their efforts. A lot of the times we'll say, raise a puppy, change a life, and the life you change may be your own. Supervising Puppy Raiser Field Manager Anne Tyson said. Puppies begin their journey at the GDB main campus in San Rafael, California. GDB works with puppy raisers in 10 Western states. At two months of age, the pups are ready to get going and will be sent via a puppy truck to their next location. The puppies will work with raisers until they are 16 months, focusing on four basic fundamentals good house behavior, good relieving habits, good confidence in public, and good manageability. The puppies are Labrador Retrievers, Golden Retrievers, crosses all bred and crosses all bred by GDB at their main campus. These, these breeds have been most successful at becoming guide dogs and are selectively bred for health, confidence, manageability, and a calm temperament, according to Tyson. Since the Wintachi Club was established in 2011, they have raised 18 guide dogs and two dogs have become breeders. Wow, that's a long time. 2011 to 2023. Is that 12 years? 
Holy cannoli. So in 12 years, it's only been about, it's been 20 dogs total. How many dogs is that per year? I need to count. Hold on. Basic math. This is why I went to college. Okay. <laughs> Don't get on me. <laughs> um, how many dogs? Oh, wait. 20 dogs, right? Over 13 years. So that's, a, that's only a dog and a half per year. I don't know. That seems really small. That can't be right. I, maybe they've gone some years without dogs at the club. And one is still in active training. The other has graduated. Nancy Pryor poses with Vera, the most recent Wintachi GDB graduate. You know, in, in the video, we'll watch it later. We'll watch it here soon. Um, there are only two puppies in the video, so maybe it is a very, very small club. While not all puppies graduate with a client and become guides, they can use their training to become a hearing dog for a person with deafness or support dog for court systems. Eight dogs from the Wenatot Wenatchee Club have gone on to other services. We support the dog from birth through puppy raising, through becoming a guide dog, being a guide, and retirement. Tyson said. There's no dog brought into our program that isn't taken care of for its entire life. Volunteers within the Wenat Wenatchee Puppy Raising Club work in capacity that they are comfortable with. For some, that might be mean being a full-time puppy raiser. For others, that might mean assisting with fundraising or flyer design. A full-time puppy raiser will have the pup until they are ready to go to formal training. This is a position with a large commitment. There is the daily care and training sessions that go into raising a puppy, while also monitoring the puppy's behavior and utilizing teaching moments to help them grow. As they mature and learn, they become a better behaved dog, have different teaching moments, are taken into the human world, become socialized, and learn how to behave appropriately in a human world setting. Puppy Cub Club leader Barb Dunn said, we take them everywhere with us if possible, providing the situation and the ability of the puppy allows. And I think that's really important too, because every puppy is going to be out doing training at a different pace. And I can think of several dogs, which I've trained directly with, that needed more or less time out in public. Reaver, my dog, who's currently sleeping and completely ignoring me. He normally pops his head up when I say his name. He's out, he's so, he's so out. It's such a dreary day today. But I remember with him, even a good handful of months after I initially got him at eight weeks, uh, he is so easily excitable. So easily excitable. And this is a genetic trait, right? I would do three minute training sessions with him, three to five minute training sessions. And since I wanted to be training for half an hour, maybe an hour, if I knew he could do it during the day, I would time myself, set my timer for three minutes, pop out of the car, go into a low distraction environment. Parking lot's a great example. Train for three minutes, really simple, easy stuff. Just focus on me, right? Do your station pad work, everything. And then go back in the car, take a break, drive over the next parking spot over, do it all again. And we would do that for maybe, again, maybe half an hour, maybe an hour, depending on the day. Because every little thing for him would get him excited. Now I have Joe, who is a standard poodle puppy, fantastically solid. I can go take her out to a brand new place for half an hour and she is not phased. She can settle really well. She takes everything in stride. She's not easily excitable, right? And that's the difference that you have to adjust yourself and your training strategy to the dog that's in front of you, going at their pace, right? Because our dogs are always communicating with us. They're always telling us what they need. The question becomes, are we competent and educated enough to know what steps to take next. Are we communicating efficiently with each other? So those are the things to keep in mind. 
A part-time volunteer splits the time with another family where they have the puppy for a few days a week for about a year or have them full-time for part of the year. There are also puppy sitters who may commit to a few days a month. Puppy sitters are around for puppies to be exposed to others, which is necessary for their training, or when puppy raisers are going out of town or on vacation. Even though we all learn the same techniques, people have different pitch or tone to their voice. Different inflections may handle the leash slightly differently, Dunn said. All these things are a little different from person to person. By spending time with others, the pup becomes more flexible and skilled in their response to a handler. That's actually a fantastic point, especially the way that guide dogs from the blind runs their program, right? Because every program is going to run a little bit differently. Uh, mine, for example, puppy goes home to the handler on the weekends. So there's really no need to worry about that because we already know who the handler is going to be. But in a program like this, where you have hundreds of applicants every year, and sometimes a dog is not, he like, you'll try it out with, with a person and either the, the, maybe the person and dog aren't clicking, maybe the pace is too fast or too slow, maybe the personalities aren't quite right for each other, then, then you need to switch, right? That happens too. Um, because they only have a two week uh, training period where they get to practice with each other. Right? So again, it depends on the organization and how it's run. Eventually, the puppies will be recalled or sent to formal training after being evaluated by Tyson. The pups in Wenatchee usually travel down to the GDB training campus in Bowring, Oregon. After passing eight levels of training there, they will be paired with someone who has applied for a guide dog. That applicant will meet their dog at one of the two campuses and will become part of a class who will all work with their new guide dogs together. The schooling, transportation to and from campus, and dogs are all provided to the client for free, including follow-up training should they need it. A lot of comments that people say, you know, when they get their guide dog is to lead freedom and inclusion and just get a bigger involvement in community, Dunn said. Oftentimes, they'll say it's like flying instead of using a white cane. That's fantastic. I love this article. Jordan Gonzalez, fantastic work. Oh, I guess we should watch the video now. Let's do that. For us as raisers, we can get them very young. We get them about eight weeks off the puppy truck. And this little guy is about 10 weeks old. Um, he just came off the puppy truck before Christmas. And um, so we start out just with really basic stuff. Yeah, Relieving you know. is a big thing. Oh, standing on it too. Um, they learn to relieve on command. And we get them onto a schedule for that so that we have control over that. Um, they learn to take food nicely and they learn their name and they learn. I will say the one thing that always has bugged me a little bit about guide dogs for the blind is that they have all of their dogs on head halters and head halters only. I would really like to know if they have any numbers behind neck injuries or neck strains related to that because I know. I, I heard a quote from a chiropractic vet and how they really hate head halters because it can cause a lot of cervical injuries and strains. And I've been told that it can create whiplash in dogs. You know, like if you get into a car accident and you whip around, I've been told it can do that. Um, now, they do also have a very special conditioning process that these dogs go through, as I mean, I do as well, um, but I have a double-ended leash system that I do it on, right? So I have uh, the dog is primarily a lot le uh, leashed on their collar to prevent that whiplash from occurring, and the only time that I actually add any pressure to the headpiece is if I can't get the dog's attention or if the dog's trying to sniff something, right? And it's very, very light pressure. I teach the dog from a very young age to give into the slightest bit of pressure so that, that that strain and that whiplash doesn't happen. So just a little anecdote from, from my own personal perspective. And some basic commands. Um, and then uh, they proceed into, you know, bigger things, more commands, 
right? Right there. Like the puppy wants to play with the other dog. And what does he do? He gets to the end of it. And since it's the only thing that he has on him that's connected to a leash, it's it's pulled, right? Let's watch that again. You know, bigger things, more commands. Um, and then uh, they proceed into, <laughs> right. you know, bigger things, no. more commands. We take them out into the public to socialize them. Uh, they need to learn to become comfortable in a human world. Because if you think about people, they do some weird things and they go some weird places, right? They go to noisy places. People do do weird public. things, man. They go to church, they go to work. Not gonna lie. They have to lay <laughs> under the desk for, you know, three hours at a time or things like that. All those different things. Very nice talk. They have to learn to be comfortable in that environment. And that is a big thing that we do is the socialization. Um, by the time they leave us as razors, um, they're just a very well-mannered, very nice dog and confident and... Yeah, I mean, look at this dog. Um, He's fantastic already. Just chill it. You know, like and they, how old is he? He's probably like six or seven months old. They a little bit for themselves and they, they you know, learn how to react oh, who's this guy? and what we want. A lot I got very tight on the leash. Say, it's just uh, you know, it's less than ideal. Is at least you know? freedom and inclusion and just a very But I understand why they do it. I just wish they could you know, also add in the collar say it's for like their leash. Now instead of using the white cane. A lot of times we'll say um, raise a puppy, change a life, mm -hmm. and the life you change may be your own. Um, it's, That's very true. Um, it's definitely a community of, of people that do puppy raising and you meet wonderful friends, um, lifetime connections. It's, and little guys too. Guys. All right. Well, that's all that I have for you guys today. Please remember to follow me on my socials. You can see me raising Joe, the puppy, and many other future service dogs, as I'm sure there will be in our program. We have expanded our program recently, so I will be taking on more dogs as long as there's demand. Okay. So follow me on my socials at Caitlin's Animals everywhere. I am currently most active on TikTok. So if you want to see daily training updates, what I'm doing with the current dog I'm boarding and training, follow me over there. All right. I'm also on Facebook at Caitlin's Animal Training. Uh, my website is at, uh, is at <laughs> caitlinsanimals.com. And that's it. That's all I have for you guys. So thank you so much for joining. I will see you guys on the next one and have a great rescue week. Bye guys.